Good morning, everyone. Welcome to ACEFED Families Alameda Board of Education Candidates Forum on Special Education. My name is Heather Padgett, and I am one of the co-chairs of the Alameda Special Education Family Support Group. We're very excited to have you joining us today for what might be ACEFED's first special ed focused forum ever. Um, I don't know that for a fact. Um, ACEBED operates as a subcommittee of the Alameda PTA Council and has been in existence for uh, 20 years. We do many things, but our most visible role is providing education and support opportunities for families of special ed students, and it is in that spirit that we are here today. For today's forum, we have six of the seven candidates running for AUSD School Board Trustee. I will let them introduce themselves in a minute, but we wanted to let you know that one of the seven candidates, Leland Trayman, declined to join us today, he was invited. A few quick items relating to our process before we begin. We will start by asking each candidate to do a one minute introduction and then we will run through six questions. Each candidate will have two minutes to answer each question. Danielle Poole will be serving as our timer today. Can you say hello, Danielle? Good morning. If candidates go over the time limit by more than a few words, we will, be, <clears throat> we will mute them. We will start by having candidates introduce themselves, and we are using reverse ballot order to begin today. Uh, then, starting with question one, we will rotate through the list of candidates in that same reverse ballot order. As we move from question to question, the next candidate on the list will start. And since we have six questions, each candidate will get the chance uh, to start and to go last. When we are done with questions, candidates will have two minutes for a closing statement. For our questions, we solicited input from the community on topics and questions they were interested in. Questions were primarily submitted by parents and they reported having kids with special needs in almost every school in Alameda. So we got a, a, a good cross section in terms of folks submitting questions. From that very long list, we created six questions. There are many more topics submitted than we could possibly address today, but I wanted to let everyone viewing know that I did share all the questions with our candidates and please feel free to follow up directly with them on any specific topic not addressed today. And uh, when I, uh, I'm going to send up a follow up after this and I'm happy to include um, email contacts for all the candidates. Uh, and lastly, in terms of process, as most folks know, special education is a complex topic and we opted to share our questions with the candidates in advance. One of ACEFED's goals this year is to try to make our work more accessible. And so to that end, we are operating, offering integrated closed captioning for today's forum. If, you don't, if you'd like closed captioning and you don't see it um, on your screen, um, there should be a closed caption button and you can click on show subtitle. Uh, we're planning to figure out language interpretation next, so please stay tuned, not for this session, but in the future. We're gonna get started. But before we launch into questions, I want to quickly introduce my co-moderator, Ellie Archer. Ellie, can you say hello? Hi, everyone. Ellie is a member of the ACEBED Advisory Board and a fellow parent of two children in AUSD, and we'll, we will be tag teaming on questions today. All right, with that, I think we're ready to begin. Please note and that this is being recorded. Thank you, Tag. It is being recorded and we will, sh we will share uh, the video with all uh, registered participants as well as um, sort of putting out uh, publicly. Uh, I'm going to turn to opening statements, candidates. So we'll, we'll start with Jennifer Williams, who uh, you have one minute. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Jennifer Williams. I'm currently the vice president of the Alameda Board of Education. I'm the only incumbent um, running for re-election in this race. Um, and, you know, we're facing a critical time in public education right now with this pandemic. And we know that the pandemic uh, disproportionately impacts our families receiving special ed services. And the only candidate running that's been attending all board meetings and all town halls around this issue and would hit the ground running, obviously, if reelected to the board. If reelected, my priorities are to continue to provide stable leadership um, during this time to improve the outcomes um, for our families receiving special education services, and to you know, finally address the systemic inequities that have existed in AUSD for our um, African-American students in particular and students uh, receiving 
special education services. Um, I'm proud to say I have the endorsement of the Alameda Education Association, um, Mayor Marilyn Ezzie Eshcraft, other uh, elected officials and community members, and I would be honored to have your support as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Megan Speaks. Remember to unmute. Hi, everyone. My name is Megan Sweet, and I am uh, running for school board as well. Uh, what I thought would be helpful to do is just share which viewpoints I'll be, be coming into this meeting with. Um, first, I come as an aunt of a nephew with severe disabilities who passed away while in his school's custody. And from that experience, I understand deeply the advocacy and heartbreak that parents of students with special needs can undergo, which begins almost at birth for some children and includes all facets of their lives from medical care, education, and access to public spaces. Uh, the list goes on. Um, so I, I wanna first honor and appreciate all the parents and advocates who convene this event and who work tirelessly to support their children. I know um, how hard that work is and I bow to the passion and care that you're providing to your children um, and making sure that they have their needs met. And I just wish it wasn't so difficult for all students to receive the education that they deserve. The second lens I come with is as a former special education teacher. So I've experienced firsthand the levels of bureaucracy that bind our special education system and the inequities that exist for many students with IEPs. And finally, I come as a district administrator and I've worked with uh, to advocate uh, and advocate administrators to um, transform our education system. So I come with a, a unique blend of perspectives that I think help give me a well-rounded uh, view of these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Just a reminder, these are one minute intros. I think we might've had some um, confusion on our timing, but um, we'll proceed with one minute if that uh, works for everybody. Heather Little. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, the day that I filed uh, my papers, I knew that um, special education was going to be a top priority to me. Uh, 20 years ago, I took a job with Seneca Family of Agencies, my first grown up job, and I held a number of different positions, including classroom counselor, special education teacher, and the operations director, which was the principal role. Um, my time with Seneca helped me really get a good foundation in what uh, in the importance of social emotional development and mental health and its connection to the, a child's ability to learn. And I'm currently the systems director with First Five Association, and that has uh, uh, provide me with an opportunity to really understand early childhood and its connection to family resiliency and quality early learning. But despite my background, I do not have the lived experience of being a special education student or the parent of a special education student. And that's why um, the very first uh, major campaign uh, aspect that I did was to hold a forum and to listen to the parents all along the way. And I know that it's changing and it's ever evolving and that I plan on listening to uh, the parents and the teachers and, the, and various stakeholders to make sure that I elevate SPED voices and that, there's, uh, and that they're included in the uh, decision-making process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next is Verna Castro. Thank you, Parent Committee, for the invite. It's been quite a morning for me. Uh, I want to start by calling on my ancestors for their wisdom and hope for a united Alameda during this difficult set of situations. At 5 p.m. last night, I began researching, gathering my thoughts, writing when seven hours later at 1 a.m., an unknown hacker appeared on my Google Doc. I tried several times, but just couldn't remove them. 20 seconds later, before I sign out, my entire paper was deleted. In fact, I was locked out of my computer. Luckily, my friend awoke and provided me access to her computer, empathetically sat, sat by me until 5 a.m. As I grounded myself in the grit that has carried me through my life, my lived experience, my spirit and resolve to complete my destiny, I've given this day the best I can give. I want to uh, also mention I'm a 27-year teacher, eight-year administrator, program administrator. I was an assistant principal, athletic director, athletic coach. I'm here to serve the uniqueness of every child in Alameda schools who, who deserve the very best. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John Castleberry. Hi, thank you for this opportunity. My name is John Castleberry. Um, I decided to run for school board because I'm a lifelong advocate of children, and I share the dedication and commitment of educators and teachers to upload children's experiences and broadening the perception of their perception of themselves and the world around them. I want to I want to bring a perspective that I believe is critical to accomplishing a more equitable uh, approach to governance. While our district and school board have made many great forward strides and accomplishments over the years, 
Uh, what is irrefutable is that there are segments of our community that remain underserved and have been for decades. As a school board member, I look forward to the opportunity to participate in collaborative efforts to enrich students, families, and teachers' experiences as we create and implement policies and practices that are inclusive, equity-based, and financially viable solutions to the many real-time challenges we all face as a diverse community. Thank you. Thank you. Bethany. Good morning, my name is Beth Aini. I'm running for school board because I care about public education and I'm devoted to putting kids first, building community, and improving educational opportunities for kids, especially second language learners and students with special needs. I have deep connections with our schools and community and I'm most qualified to serve as a school board member. My qualifications are evident through my service as PTA president at Otis Elementary for two years where I started the first equity and inclusion committee at any AUSD school and worked tirelessly to engage families and build communities, including students with special needs and their families. I'm now in my second term as PTA council president, where I work with all PTAs in Alameda, including this particular subcommittee, the ACEBED subcommittee, on equity issues in particular to ensure that all students, regardless of address um, or, or needs, have the tools, experiences, and resources they need to be successful in school. I was the chair of the successful Yes on Measure A campaign, which provides a dedicated stream of funds into AUSD for much needed and well-deserved teacher and staff salary increases. And I hope that those will assist our special education families to ensure that we have funds to provide resources for our kids. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Ellie, do you wanna move? All right, thank you all candidates for your introduction. We are going to start with our questions now. And for, for this, we are going to stick with the reverse ballot order for the first question. So we are going to start with Jen, but I'm gonna read the question out to you. You have all been campaigning for several weeks now. What is, the, what is your sense of the district's greatest challenges when it comes to special education? What would you do as a board member to address them? And we start with Jen. Thank you. Um, I think the, the one thing that we need to do is really change the culture in AUSD around uh, what special education is. And we need to have much more collaboration between our general education teachers and our special education teachers. Um, historically, there has not been joint efforts and professional development around collaboration until this year. This is the first year that we actually have time for that type of collaboration built into our master schedule. So I'm hoping that we will begin to change the culture um, by having closer relationships with our teaching staff. Um, I also think you know, our sites need to be more involved with our families receiving special education services. Oftentimes principals don't really um, know or are aware of the level of services that the students that attend their schools receive. So we need to really start changing the culture so that everybody at our school site feels welcome. Um, I think we do this also by improving our tier one instruction um, across all district schools and across all classrooms, you know, implementing universal designs for learning, for example, because we know not all kids learn the same way. So the district has started this work. It needs to continue on with this work because we really need to um, impress upon all of our students and parents involved in a, in a classroom that all of our kids are different, um, but we can all learn in the same way with the right support. Um, the other big issue I think we need to do is improve the relationship between our special ed families and the district. Um, I think we do this by listening to families. Um, you know, th the moments that I have one-on-one -on -one conversations with families receiving special education services, it is profound. Um, it's a profound impact, I guess I should say, on me, what they deal with. And we really need to work hard to improve trust. Um, we need to reduce litigation costs. Families should not have to fight so hard for the services in this district that they're legally entitled to. Um, having more interaction with our families is something that would be really important to me if re-elected. Thank you. Thank you. Megan, you're next. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. You know, um, through the campaigning, but also through my review, the comprehensive review of special education findings that came out of AUSD, um, sorry, AUSD, I used to work in AUSD. Um, there's a lot of different um, things that, that come up for me that feel really important for us to start looking at right away. 
One of them is that there, are some, there was some real evidence of, of a basic last, lack of systems and structures across the district for identifying and uh, moving students through special education programming, um, ensuring that their IEPs are reviewed annually, updated, communication with parents is effective, and, and special education services are provided within 60 days. And to me, those all signal a lack of systems across the district. Um, which then puts the undue burden on the parents of special needs students or students with IEPs to do a lot of advocacy, the lawsuits, everything else to make that compliance come true. So I would say one of the first things we really need to do is start addressing some of those technical issues because that would be able to address a lot of students and family needs quickly. And that means creating a district-wide system for doing that work. Uh, we also need to hire, <clears throat> excuse me, hire and train more uh, qualified staff. Um, my lived experience is that a lot, lots of times the non-compliance is because we have insufficient staff holding this work. Um, so they're learning on the job. They don't, aren't aware always of the deadlines and due dates and, and the re legal requirements of the students that they're serving. So we actually need to put more time and money into hiring um, highly qualified staff to do this work. Um, like Jennifer said, I also agree that what we need to do is, is shore up our basic systems and supports for all students and families. The district has begun to implement what's called the multi-tiered system of support. And that level one support, uh, which really is intended to, to support all students, um, is something that we should be investing in more so that we can ensure that students have their needs met earlier on in the process um, and with everyone else. So thank you. Thank you, Megan. Heather Ladle. Hi, good morning. Um, Definitely, you know, uh, I have a lot of friends who have children with special education needs and uh, I think when I started the campaign was when I really started to get direct with them and ask for lots of input from people about what are the complications, what are the concerns, what are the reasons why people are dissatisfied with AUSD's special education program. And there were three primary things that definitely rose to the top. Obviously, you know, what uh, both Megan and Jen have already said, the need to recruit and retra retain qualified teachers and staff. One third of our teachers and staff are not credentialed currently. And I think that we could do things such as providing CEUs, providing additional training and making sure that we're creating a pathway for that. Additionally, creating that culture of acceptance that right now there's a general sense of othering throughout our district and that we have to make sure that our special education students have a sense of belonging instead or in included in every educational experience that's possible. Thirdly, ensuring service and communication consistency across the district to make sure that you know, there's no unpredictability in the transition and change for students, knowing how important it is that consistency across our district, if, if kids are moved or if teaching styles change, it's very disruptive to their learning. As a board member, I want to make sure that, you know, uh, this year, actually just at the last board meeting, they had a dedication to special education. And I want to make sure that that's uh, continued throughout and that the board has time to ask questions. I also want to see if we could explore having a specific subcommittee for um, the board members to participate in that could potentially include the special education steering committee members, staff, teachers, administration, and also representatives from this group to participate in and have that very strong board presence that um, could demonstrate, hopefully, and lead to positive change and better outcomes for our students. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Verna Castro. Uh, th thank, thank you for that question. Um, I think racism is the biggest challenge because it presents clear system. In so one of the things that was mentioned earlier is that we need to do a equity audit uh, among the system within special education. And the data will show what's needed. Our black and brown children are disproportionately placed in classes as a pathway to low self-esteem and failure in society once they leave the system. The need for representation, courageous leadership at the board level to see, call out, and act upon these disparities that we perpetuate is needed now more than ever. A further challenge is that the 2018 bold strategic plan that's laid out by our superintendent needs to be followed through fruition. It's very comprehensive. And it, the board members need to assure that the superintendent receives the necessary supports to get the job done. Uh, agreed with a teacher and parent shortage crisis, this is all over the state. Superintendent Scuderi has a plan for being a retaining talented teachers and parents. Currently, the board has, some do not have permits. That is true. 
Federal government standards for SPEDS yet has health funds back. Full IDA has been under resourced for many years. With a state education budget shortfall, this presents another challenge. So we need creative thinkers. Stigma in special education creates low self-esteem, lack of motivation, and an unwelcome environment that will be addressed because it's all students are welcome here in Alameda. It's essential to understand the circumstances of distance learning the impact on both mild, moderate, and moderate to severe. They get individualized attention from professionals trained in and deeply familiar with their unique ways of thinking, perceiving, and processing. So a great challenge is providing faith under shelter in place. The love and care at home is turning parents into sped teachers overnight. This is creating a myriad of issues. The students and families need in-home support services and resources. A collaboration needs to happen with the community. So I'm in support of that. So let's continue to talk together as we create these positive solutions for our, for our students. Thank you so much, Farina. John, John Kesselberg. Hi, thank you for this question. Um, uh, one of the first um, uh, things that's impacting is um, the hiring and the staffing of qualified professionals, paraprofessionals and teachers, um, assessments and, and, and the, the, just the inconsistency and the instability of not having a same teacher because teacher-students relationship really matter um, in, in order for um, a student to learn from somebody, they have to uh, have, have trust that person. And to trust that person, they need to have a relationship with that person. Um, assessment and methods of classification um, is a, is a, uh, is, seems to be a big issue. And early identification and, inter and intervention. Also inclusivity. Um, not everyone is made to feel like they belong. And that, and that is a, um, a, a, a very um, pervasive uh, sentiment that I'm finding among the many parents I'm speaking to about spe that have special needs children is that they feel like their children are not, they feel like their concerns are not on, of a priority and they feel like they are um, uh, like, a, like a, a, a second class group and uh, the same common concert, uh, considerations that are given to the general uh, population are not afforded them. So um, I, I think, you know, also I know that, you know, a lot of work has gone into the special ed strategic plan and, and I intend to continue to drill down into every nuance of that plan and, and hopefully um, involve more uh, communication with parents, um, making sure that they have a, a, that their voices are heard um, and, that, and, and, and that their concerns are addressed. Thank you so much, John. Beth. Thank you. Um, when, when I was working on the Measure A campaign, I had a lot of opportunity to spend time with the superintendent and talk about um, where funds from Measure A would be spent and how they would be spent. And during those conversations, it was shocking to me when I found out that, you know, nearly one third of our special education teachers aren't credentialed and don't have very significant experience. And that's not to say that they're bad. But that's to demonstrate really the, the shortage of teachers who are very experienced um, in this state, you know, to deal with our most vulnerable children. So I, I fully um, expect that Measure A funds will be used to support our children in that way so that we can find, attract, and retain qualified special education teachers for our special education students who really need those supports in the classroom and during this distance learning time. We also need to spend more uh, resources on our paraprofessionals and individual specialists. Um, there are certainly not enough to go around in this district and those uh, support staff are critical to ensure that there is learning continuity in the classroom to support our kids um, and to support the teachers as well. Um, another thing, as uh, Ms. Williams said, we need to improve the relationship between families and the district. And I know there is a long history of, of distrust um, and concern that the district hasn't been working to support our special education families. We need to improve that. And the board certainly needs to get involved and figure out ways that we can mend that relationship so that we can all work together in, in doing the best thing for our special education students. And as a board member, I would certainly do that. My One of my key goals is to, to network and build connections and make sure that people are feeling welcome and not marginalized in our community and in our schools. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. 
I'm going to turn to question two now. Uh, in 2018, the board approved a three-year special education strategic plan. Based on your knowledge of AUSD, what do you think are the most achievable goals outlined in the strategic plan and which would pose the biggest challenge to implement? What is the role of the board in holding the superintendent and staff accountable for implementing this, the special education strategic plan? We will start with Megan Sweet. Yeah, thanks for the question. And it's exciting to read a strategic plan um, directly supporting uh, special education students. Um, it's an impressive document. So I'm, I'm excited to have that as something to be working from. I think the thing that is most urgent um, and also achievable for the district is the intervention and identification and the proactive service delivery model. Um, because both of those really are um, things that are building on some of the other general district-wide strategies and could provide opportunities for students um, at all levels of the system and whether they have an IEP or not to get service and support, which is an ideal situation. Some of the things that I think that need to be addressed um, immediately when starting to look at that specific issue is the disproportionality of African-American students in special education, um, the lack of compliance um, for students with IEPs in their least restrictive environment, um, and the way that <clears throat> a multi-tiered system of support could help all students. So that feels like a really urgent and important one to start with right away. Um, one of the ones that I think will be more challenging, but also is really necessary is, is the monitoring and compliance. I think it's an area of real need for the district to be proactive in how they're identifying students, looking at trends and avoiding lawsuits and actually using that funding um, to provide support for students. There's a clear need for that for systems across the district to be developed and put in place. And um, as a board member, I think one of the main things that board members can do is to ensure that those district-wide systems are put in place to um, continue to ask questions, um, work with district staff on implementing the special education strategic plan, um, looking for resources to help to augment that plan um, when the resources aren't available and having making some of those hard decisions around how resources will be allocated um, and support of special education students given all the other competing priorities that we have to face as a district. Thank you. Uh, Heather Little. Um, so um, looking at our special education um, uh, strategic plan and knowing just like our district-wide strategic plan, it really sets the tone for conversations and expectations for what we want to have as a culture surrounding the population that it's serving. And back in August, I took some time to really review it. And I was actually really impressed and have named this a couple of times, but how thorough it was and how dedicated the people were when they were going through the process of creating it. But once a plan is created, then it all becomes about implementation. And I've talked with several people who participated in the process and it's really unclear to me about how we've taken any steps to ensure that the plan has been adhered to and followed through. Um, that being said, I think the most achievable goal is the communications goal. It has a robust set of actions that would be of little cost. And as we've heard several people today um, naming that communication has been identified by the families, especially as something that really needs to be addressed. And I actually think the one that's least achievable based on how this particular strategic plan has been created is the monitoring and compliance because there's no stated benchmarks or real measurements to help us determine if we're meeting those goals. And um, in talking with the district, I think they are in the process or have already hired an outside organization to help advise us on how we could get the strategic plan to be more measurable, but it's ending at the end of the school year. And so I think going forward, I'd really like to see the steering committee, you know, be afforded that opportunity to be much more involved again, and that it be part of a public process as we're going forward so that um, meetings and, and talking about with the steering committee about what the efforts um, about implementation look like are a much more transparent process so that the public can be involved as well. And I would also like the next strategic plan to really call out an aspect of equity. Equity is kind of sprinkled throughout and alluded to throughout the plan, but especially now so important as we've heard other people say, it needs to be an explicit section. Thank you. Thank you. Verna Castro. Thank you for this very important question. And, and uh, 
one of the primary roles, first of all, of the board is to supervise and evaluate the superintendent. And I think that's critical, again, to, to, to walk along the superintendent because it is the board who does pass the, these, uh, the policies. So based on the three to five years strategic plan identified key services and supports that have to be in place. Um, I, I chose um, the first, the most achievable because I've worked on strategic plans in my work on the district level currently. And I think the most important is leadership and communication because without leadership, a plan can't move anywhere. You need that person to hold it down and to hold people accountable. And the second part is communication. I mean, unless you, you have clear co communication, once again, you need all the stakeholders involved in the process of it to, to, to ensure that things are followed through. So, um, you know, I, I believe that um, high le levels of trust and respect and collaboration between the parents, especially teachers and staff. I too have spoken to quite a few parents along the way. Um, and this is happening in all cities, um, at, you know, in Alameda, you know, uh, this disconnect between parents, particularly this time during COVID. Um, this is a time to really lean in and dig and to find out uh, what these issues are so that we can work on this together. And again, I want to bring up racism. I mean, there's a lot of uh, distrust with uh, community. So my job, you know, being a, you know, BIPOC female, LGBTQT, is that, you know, I, I can, I have authentic relationships with parents. I can talk the talk. I've been in the uh, a BIPOC area, you know, which, which, you know, serves a special ed students. So, you know, and going back to leadership, uh, once the superintendent articulates his story authentically, and he shows up to the stakeholder meetings. I've seen that. I've been to the town hall meetings. He communicates clearly the structures and platforms holding people accountable. I, I believe this goal can be seen. This, the second part, is, uh, the challenging uh, piece I, I chose is the service delivery model. And I chose this because the continuum of services that is important to develop the whole child is research-based. And these approaches, uh, you're welcome. Thank you. Yep. Uh, John Castleberry. Hi. Uh, so I think, uh, first of all, enforcing and implementing uh, reporting requirements for site administrators, I think is going to be very important. Um, I, I also agree. I think that um, the, the most achievable goal, I think, is going, to, I believe, is going to be communication. It doesn't, it doesn't take, uh, it doesn't take budget decisions to communicate to people. Um, that's something that we can just do. I think one of the most difficult aspects is going to be um, addressing the, dis the disproportionality that's happening because it's going to involve changing hearts and minds. The disproportionality that's happening among African boys is because they're viewed differently. They're viewed differently by administrators. They're, they're viewed, the, the same behavior, their behavior uh, is viewed differently than those of their peers that don't look like them. And, and they often are misidentified. Um, they disengage because they just simply don't feel important to whoever's teaching them. They will disengage. And that is often misdiagnosed as, a, as, a, as an um, attention deficit situation. When it's just simply like you're not looking at the external, what other ex external issues are happening for that child. And, and, and this is nothing that's, and I don't, want, I don't want to make it sound like this is a, um, a simple fix or that it is not a complex issue because it very much is. Um, I also think, you know, transparency and trust, it, 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 it must and it can be nurtured between the district and parents. It just, again, it just takes communication, it takes outreach, and it takes listening and not only listening, but uh, for lack of a better way to say it, but granting validity to the experiences that people are telling you that they're having and, 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 and making it a priority. So this is um, just just getting people to listen is often seems something that can be so simple, but it can be so difficult because everybody comes with their their preconceived notions, and it's hard to change hearts and minds. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Beth Amy. Thank you. Um, for me, um, th the most achievable goal. Uh, in the special education strategic plan is leadership and communication. And I, I think we've seen that from the superintendent and I know um, he's very committed to making positive changes for our special education families. 
the most um, difficult goal, I think, in the strategic plan to achieve based on um, my discussions with special education families and my understanding of um, how assessments and evaluations are, are processed within the district is, is the intervention and identification uh, goal. Um, there needs to be some more consistent evaluation of our children, early assessments to make sure that, that students are identified, consistent te testing methodologies to ensure that uh, certain areas of need aren't falling through the cracks and we're not just simply looking at some sort of composite score um, that doesn't fall below um, the marker. You know, there are ways that we can identify our kids early so that they are getting the services that they need um, and don't require significant inter intervention later on. Um, I do think that we are now kind of in the middle of the strategic plan. It goes from 2018 to 2021. It would be good um, to have some updates to figure out where we are with this strategic plan, to, to identify whether we have uh, met or are in the process of meeting the goals, um, and to know what, what interventions the district needs to take to make sure that we're getting there, or if we need to revise a strategic plan in any way to make sure that we can really accommodate and address the concerns that were outlined in the strategic plan. And if on the board, I would certainly make sure that that happened and meet with our families to ensure that needs and concerns are addressed. Thank you. Jennifer Williams. Thank you. Um, the board or the district has done some work uh, in meeting the goals of the strategic plan. Um, for example, we've done a good job, I think, in um, rolling out positive behavior intervention supports, uh, multi-tiered systems of support. We're starting to see that work across all sites. You know, there was a time in this district where, when the work was done in silos and each school had their own programs and policies going on and we're really starting to see things being implemented across the district, which I think is a step in the right direction. Um, we've implemented the STAR academic assessment in elementary. Um, we've adopted a social emotional curriculum um, called Toolbox for K to fifth grade. Uh, which I think is also a step in the right direction. And then finally, you know, with regard to staffing, I'm, I'm proud to say that we're finally fully staffed this year in special ed. This is the first time um, as of this week, we've been fully staffed in special ed in four years. Um, so I think that we will begin to see significant improvements now that we have adequate staffing. I think that's a huge component of the strategic plan. And um, I think the district's done a good job in, in that work. Um, but there's a lot that needs to be uh, worked on, obviously. Um, as I said earlier, making sure tier one instruction is robust at all school sites. Um, and I'm talking about standard-based instruction, universal de designs for learning, um, you know, consistent understanding of, of when teachers and site staff refer children to COS. Um, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done around that. As I said, the STAR uh, assessment tool has been implemented. We need behavioral assessments done. Um, we do have a strategic plan or a, a, steering, a steering committee, excuse me, for the strategic plan. They've only met twice. We need to reinstitute those meetings. The board needs to have uh, regular updates with regard to um, the strategic plan from the um, steering committee and hold uh, the district staff accountable so that all of the goals in the plan are met. Thank you, Jennifer. Ellie? Unmute, Ellie. Thank you. We're gonna to move to our third question now. While the pandemic and the loss of in-person learning has been, has been hard on all students, educators agree that it has been particularly hard on special education students. In AUSD, special education is challenged in the best of times. Those challenges are magnified now. Some families have not yet received their IEP aligned emergency plans required by Senate Bill 98. Some are receiving services in large groups that should be provided one-on-one. -on -one. Many don't have access to paraprofessionals. Some are even being told that progress towards IEP goals will not be measured during the emergency period. The intent of the federal IDA law passed decades ago to ensure that 
was to ensure that all children receive a free and appropriate public education. We know this is a challenging time for all, but what would you do as a board member to ensure that our students who need the most are provided what they need and are legally entitled to receive during their pandemic closure? And then for this question, we are going to start with Heather Little. Thank you. Um, yeah, SB 98, the omnibus education bill, it, it really required a, a, a huge task to be taken over in such a short period of time. I mean, our district was asked to uh, amend more than a thousand IEPs and trying to figure out what the logistics of parasupport, occupational therapy, speech, et cetera, would look like um, uh, and, and how that those modified workloads were going to take place in a virtual format, all the while knowing that uh, for many students, uh, general education, but particularly special education students were not going to be successful in this because it's just not a best practice. And as Ellie noted, this has been, I'm, I can't even imagine how difficult this has been for everyone, but the whole point of special education is to take into account individual learning styles. And for many, e-learning is not and will not be optimal. Um, by the time, you know, the new board gets seated, we're gonna be halfway through the school year. And I hope that we can, uh, you know, we can accomplish um, making sure that there's going to be a plan in place to make up the missing hours that have taken place um, already, whether it be from last school year to now currently. Um, listening to Tuesday's school board um, meeting, I was really excited to hear of the undertaking of these learning hubs and these ideas that we're hearing about that are taking place in other districts and even within our own, um, sorry, my phone is ringing, my cousin, um, uh, that, um, uh, I lost my train of thought, um, that we, uh, that we uh, expand that though, the learning hubs to also potentially be not just for moderate to severe, but that we uh, have a plan in place to bring in mild to severe, and that we also have a plan in place for the special education kids who have IEPs who are uh, in, a, in a general education setting as well, uh, because they're all not just having learning loss, they're actually experiencing a regression in learning. And I think we really benefit by listening to parents and the teachers and get some ideas around sequencing about what is important and prioritizing that and putting those things into place so that we can have a systemic plan that's going to work for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Verena Castro. Thank you again. The pandemic has impacted SPED students and our BIPOC students and their families harder than any other student. There's no way to measure for SPED students our IEP goals because it must be done in the classroom. So new processes and procedures need to happen and it's difficult at this time. IDA and FAPE don't include protocols and procedures to ensure students are receiving services safely. So it is important. Uh, I, I did attend the uh, Tuesday meeting and learning hubs were presented and it just wasn't enough. More explanation, exploration is needed to, to continue. Learning hubs were not instructional, but structures and routines as well as social hubs for students. That, that is important. I am concerned with this plan as health and safety of our students and educators are between the student and paraprofessional is really not feasible. There's a lot of contact that comes with care. So I'm primarily interested in how we'll have assurances that everyone's safe, zero transmissions before we ask parents to put their students at risk and educators at risk. Um, I, I do like the in-home support services plans. I, I think students would benefit and, and the families would benefit. How do we resource the families? As a board member, I would look to link the community so that students are supported one-to-one -one with moderate to severe supports with Paris. And that again includes looking for seeking more parents, Paris and other case managers when Paris are not available. More, these authentic partnerships are in, important for advocacy and new solutions to create a new narrative. So I also would like to consider creating a policy where teachers, parents, and support providers are classified as essential workers. I know that's outside the box, but we need to do something because we are in a crisis right now. And our most undeserved children, our special ed students, uh, need these extra supports. And it's something that we need to do now because we may never understand if we don't do something uh, immediately. Thank you so much, Verna. John Castleberry. So, the, you know, the IDEA law was, uh, was, was supposed to ensure that children receive this, this free and uh, appropriate public education. Unfortunately, the, the way that appropriate was interpreted 
um, just really falls short of really providing these students what they need. Um, and, and very often what we have seen is special ed um, students uh, receiving often what amounts to a little more than just warehousing. And even though there's so much, and that's not to take away from the dedicated uh, teachers and professionals that are committed, but it's, the, it's systemically, it's structured and they don't have the support that they need to really provide these students um, with the services that they uh, deserve. Uh, the, um, you know, with right now with the schools closed, um, all, all students are experiencing learning loss and, and the special needs families are definitely being hit the hardest by this, especially with being understaffed even at the onset. Um, it's good to hear that we have improved on our staffing. Um, we are going to have to act, you know, implement training for the staff, the new staff. We have to make sure that we have measures in place to retain the staff so that we need to um, uh, uh, get a handle on um, attrition rates. And we also need to make sure that, um, that these students are, you know, they have a right to meaningful benefit and, and, and to access academic growth. Um, they're, the, um, I, I would like to see, um, I think one approach is like small learning pods and with the district providing some home support professionals. Um, right now, and, and safety is a big issue right now with the pandemic happening. And we need to make sure that the students, the families, and their teachers and professionals are kept safe and while we try to implement all these changes and try to keep up with this ever evolving and changing situation that we find ourselves in. Thank you. Thank you, John. Beth, Amy. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for this important question. I think it um, it helps us really identify what's going on in our district now. And, and certainly there's no question that this is a challenging time for everybody. Um, and no question that, that the district has had to pivot um, very quickly to, um, to address education for our general ed population and our special education students without any kind of a roadmap or handbook um, with which to do that. Um, and I, I do want to applaud the district for all the work they've done. However, um, I, I don't think the district has done enough to ensure that our special education students are getting the services that they are legally entitled to. Um, and at the last board meeting on Tuesday, um, I certainly named this and um, brought to the attention of everyone that the um, learning continuity plan had not really been vetted and presented to uh, the community as required under the law. And when the law says shall and must, I'm putting my lawyer hat on now, um, the, the district needs to do those things. And I think as a, as a board member, um, my role, I see my role as making sure that we're holding the district accountable to what they're required to do under the law. And um, we need to make sure that our special education students are getting what they deserve. It kind of all goes back to resources uh, too. So we need to make sure that we're finding the resources to support the kids in ways that are legally mandated. Um, I think that also includes uh, the board and the community advocating for more um, financial support. Uh, we need to ensure that we are getting those resources um, and that we can do the things that we need to do to make sure that our students have um, quality education, even during this, this pandemic time, and uh, that they're getting the services, they're having their occupational therapy, speech therapy, and um, not falling even more behind. Um, during this time. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Jennifer Williams. Your meal test, Jennifer. Thank you. Sorry about that. I have a fundamental belief um, that the rights guaranteed under the federal law regarding special education, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, means that students with disabilities um, must be provided with a free and appropriate education, whether we're in COVID or not. Um, you know, the boss has not granted a waiver to any of the rights under the federal laws or the implementing regulations that govern this work. Um, and I don't believe that SB 98 has significantly changed the delivery of services that um, our students and families that receive special ed are entitled to receive. 
Um, does that mean that services may look different? Yes, it does mean that they may look different. Um, does that mean that we need to come up with emergency plans? Yes, but we do that with the input and the consent of the family. Um, and we need to be reaching out and making sure that those efforts are happening. Um, I know we have almost 1,100 IEPs that need to be revisited. Um, the workload is significant, but we must ensure that despite COVID, um, students are receiving the, the services that they're legally entitled to receive. And when they don't receive those services, compensatory services need to be put on the table. Um, this, is, this is work that I feel very strongly about. And as a board member, I, you know, my votes, I believe, especially during this pandemic, support the special ed community. I supported the Learning Hub idea. I asked for more information, and I specifically asked for information that we not limit it to the mod severe community, but that we include mild and moderate uh, students in that work as well. I was the only board member that voted for the waiver, and the, my thought process, honestly, was we need to get our mod to severe students back in the classroom. Um, that's the work that I want to see, obviously, um, in, the, in the safest way possible, um, but I was the only board member that supported that vote. Um, and, you know, I also think we need to do our research. Placer Selpa has, Placer County Selpa does an amazing job putting kids at the center of the work. Um, I think we need to take a look at other Selpas and the way they're implementing COVID, this, this time of COVID, and um, follow suit where appropriate. Thank you, Jen. Thank you so much. Megan Sweet. Yeah, this is such an important question and 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 as many of the others have mentioned it's it's a really challenging time for schools and educators um i don't know of any other profession where we've been asked to actually turn almost every element of how we do our jobs into something different um, and there are a lot of challenges with that and so I, I have a lot of respect for the district and what they've done so far and we haven't done enough um, and so i think we need to be able to hold both of those things to be true now that school has gotten underway, I think it's a perfect time for us to do, you know, home visits via Zoom or via phone calls with families with, um, of students with IEPs to understand how it's going and get a much more comprehensive review of what is and isn't working for students during this time and what might look different. So we have a good sense of the overall trends of what's happening. I have heard from families who felt that they've gotten a, really, a great deal of support from their um, schools. Um, um, for students with, with IEPs and others who have not. So that, again, is indicative to me of a school-by-school school issue rather than a district-level issue. So we really need to get on top of our district-level um, comprehensive plan around providing support and be more proactive in reaching out to families rather than waiting for them to bring the concerns to us. Uh, like Jennifer said, I also think it's a good time to reach out to others who are being more successful. Um, if, if, if this is the best we've got so far, that's okay, but then let's ask for some questions and look for resources and, and models that are working better um, for students during this time. Um, COVID isn't going to be something that's going to go away right away, and I think a lot of folks have been kind of just holding our breath, hoping that it's something that we'll just be able to return to normal in a couple of months, and that's not really... Um, likely. Um, so let's look, start learning from other people. As a board member, we um, our main job is to hold district accountable for that. So as a board member, I'd be asking those questions, continuing to keep a focus on special needs families and um, the IEPs that are, are in and out of compliance, looking for resources to be able to provide our families in our district with more resources to be able to support our students' needs and not letting this issue go, uh, but continue to keep Heather, you are muted. Yes, I know I'm muted. Question four. Um, parents of many children who spent years struggling in AUSD and now go to non-public schools, private schools, and Alameda charter schools, which operate, uh, charter schools which operate under similar funding constraints as AUSD. And they report that their children are thriving at those other schools. What are your thoughts on this? What should be done to keep families from leaving AUSD? And we're going to start with Verna Castro. Again, thank you for the question. Um, we all know that trends show an uprise of charter and now online schools and including um, these outside type of uh, hub online schools are on the rise. My first question as a board member is why are families leaving? Why are families leaving? I think what I intend to do, and one of my assets is that I want to talk to every family, okay? Or the district collaboratively needs to talk to every family. 
sometimes there's that missing data. So we need to find out, we need to, the, the talking is the informal data. And what I found currently is that they're talking about school quality. They're talking about bullying, uh, absences of high quality SPED programs. Why not high quality SPED programs? It's a program in the school. Shouldn't our students have the same high quality as the other classes? Uh, they talk about student behavioral problems. A school's reputation, yes, perspective matters. They talk about academic options and lack of support from staff and a lack of challenging environment, okay? And we've, we've addressed much of this. Firstly, again, I think that perception is as important as reality. To highlight the good programs and small successes is important. I think as a district, we need to listen to and act on parent feedback. Not just listen, let's act on it. Thinking about what makes a quality program, after all, is a primary goal as a board member for each student to achieve. Again, going back to strong teachers have to be well-trained and continuous improvement, strong feedback cycle within the district to the family. We'll continue to invite the stakeholders like ourselves to provide input so that parents stay at our public schools. All these concerns are controllable. I really enjoy this process and I think it's important for us to be a part of it. Incidentally, charter schools also drain uh, funds from public schools, um, you know, pretty much through, you know, the severe, um, you know, student work, public schools are absorbing the cost. I believe that this should be a shared system, one system, the burden should be shared. Thank you so much, Ferner. John Pesselberg. Uh, you know, this topic of uh, the charter schools comes up a lot and, um, it's 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 always very interesting to me um, to hear the different um, the different um, perspectives and the different sides of this of this uh, discussion, and and um, you know maybe um, maybe it's time to stop resenting charters and start embracing them as a part of our educational community, um, and let's look at what they are doing different from traditional public schools and learn from models of success. If they are having success in different areas of education, let's collaborate with them. Let's find out how they, what is it, what are they doing that's different than what our traditional public schools are different. And let's start uh, implementing and let's start break down these, um, these, these, these walls of divide. Um, because, uh, you know, if a, if a parent is not getting their child's needs met in one place, and they can have their needs met someplace else. I would not be the one to tell that parent, no, you, you can't go get your child's needs fulfilled. But so we need to continue to hold ourselves to a higher standard and it's such that families don't need to look elsewhere. And we need to um, start implementing and holding the district accountable. Uh, again, I think we need more, um, I think we need for site administrators to, um, to re re report difficulties um, that are that they may not be able to mitigate for whatever reason, so that they can get the support they need from the board and from the district in order to get the support that the teachers need, um, that they're trying to fulfill their commitments to these students. And we also have to we have to broaden the awareness. Of, um, of all of our teachers, educators, and administrators, in as much as uh, uh, opening, opening their view and their perspective of the different um, segments of our population in the educational community. Thank you. Thank you, John. Beth Annie? Thank you. Um, this, this is an interesting question, and, and I'm, I'm glad it was um, posed here today. I think a lot of this goes back to the strategic plan and, and the, the goals of systems of support and leadership and communication. In my discussions with so many special education families, I just get the sense of extreme frustration um, that they are, they're, they're not being listened to, their concerns are not being addressed, and ultimately they feel they, they have to go elsewhere in order to ensure that their children are being educated. Um, we need to work on being collaborators with the district rather than adversaries. 
And, and um, I, I say that in a good way because I think we can develop that partnership, but that goes back to building more trust between families and the district. Um, we need to also ensure that we're providing more professional development for especially our elementary teachers who can um, help so that those teachers can can identify um, issues that are going on in the classroom at, in the early grades and refer those kids to early evaluation so that the kids can be evaluated and get services that they need. Um, I, 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 I get that everybody's frustrated. I get the families are frustrated and I get, I, but I also see that it creates additional disparities when certain families are leaving the district, district um, to have their children go to school elsewhere. Um, families with resources can do that. Families without the resources um, may not be able to do that. And um, we need to figure out a way that we are addressing everybody's concerns that, that our families on, in, on all levels are getting what they need, feel listened to, and um, that those concerns are getting addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Jennifer Williams. Thank you. Yeah, this is a tough question. Um, our enrollment is down slightly. I think it's hovering around 9,100 students right now. Um, but the initial data is showing that we're uh, down in, in the kindergarten class, not necessarily uh, focused families uh, that are receiving special education. But nonetheless, I do hear from families that leave. Um, this question's hard because services under an IEP are so specific to each child that a child may be getting better services elsewhere. Um, and I understand that, but it's, I think it's important for families to remember that the federal protections that exist around special education apply to public schools. Um, and children have those protections in AUSD and not necessarily in um, non-public uh, opportunities. So although families may need to advocate more for their kids here, and I'm not saying that that's right, Nonetheless, at the end of the day, there are protections guaranteed to our children that we must be cognizant about. Um, but I think the core uh, co part of this question is how families are, are being treated and how they feel and um, what level of, of service they're getting here. And the bottom line is our customer service needs to improve. Um, and this is something that I think we're seeing in our strategic plan. It's the first time this district has actually called out learning gaps for our African American students. For our students with special education, we're actually targeting those areas to do better work and to serve families better. There's a lot of work that needs to be done, but having it expressly be part of our strategic plan, I think, is a step in the right direction. Um, you know, families shouldn't have to have a lawyer to feel heard, and I hear that a lot from families in this district. We need to stop that kind of uh, lit litigious approach to the work we do. I think when we have better um, tier one instruction across all grade levels, we will begin to see lower litigation rates, and I'm hopeful um, that with our new staff, uh, our collaboration will improve as well. And those are the things I would talk about to families who are thinking about leaving. Thank you, Jennifer. Megan Sweet? Yeah, thanks for this question. And, and as somebody who's held, held roles where we've I've actually monitored students moving in and out of charter schools and non-public schools and district schools uh, for many years, this is a common issue. And I'd say it really comes down to two areas that I think we need to focus on in Alameda. The first one is around funding, and the second one is around shifting from being reactive to being proactive. So the first thing with funding is that um, while charter schools are under some of the similar budget constraints as districts, it actually they have a lot more freedom. They have a lot more access to additional funding sources and flexibility on how to use those funding sources than district schools do. Um, they also tend to be smaller and therefore can be more agile with how they hire staff and are not um, beholden to union constraints that districts are. Um, and while the union constraints are fine and good, they do add a layer of complexity for school districts as they're working to support the unique needs of students. So um, special education funding is primarily funded by, this, by the federal government and they don't give enough funding to be able to actually meet the needs of students. And this puts districts in a place where they have to make really difficult decisions around which students to support and how and which students not to. And so I just think that's an area that we need to explore and look at with more detail. Um, the other thing, again, is to switch from being um, reactive to being proactive, which means looking at our data. What are the, the kinds of services that students and families are asking for that are not being met, that we're going outside of the district to receive? Which one of those can we bring back in-house again? 
um, and start to work with families in that way. Um, what schools are doing a really good job and are actually retaining their students in other schools that are particularly challenging that are actually driving, that are driving families away? What supports can we provide there? Um, so learning from ourselves, looking at our data, understanding again, what are the needs and hopefully if we start doing that, we can actually start diverting the money away from lawsuits and paying for outside services back into special education um, services within the school district again. So I do think it just takes a shift around looking more at our data and understanding what some of those trends are that we can start to address right away. Thanks. Thank you, Megan. Heather Little. Uh, thank you. Um, this question is actually uh, my favorite of all six questions that were being asked today. And I've actually spent a lot of time um, over the last six to eight weeks or so talking with families directly about why they have been uh, leaving AUSD and seeking their input on ideas. Um, I think that's the really the place to start. Jen said customer service, and I think that that's what it's about, really hearing from them and finding out their reasons why. Um, and then also taking responsibility for those actions that our district has done um, and recognizing what that responsibility means and looks like. Um, because parents are saying over and over again that the issues with special education have gone on for too long. I, it is just inconscionable to me that parents feel this necessity to fight so hard for so long and still not get the needs and services and feel compelled to leave the district and seek those services elsewhere. That being said, I think we have to be creative and open. And as other people have said, look to our neighbors, look to the charters that our you know, parents are experiencing success there. And what are they doing differently? And when possible, be able to mirror those aspects throughout. And I really, I can't say enough about the importance of really listening to families and, and hear their heartbreaking stories and hold those with honor as we're making decisions about what we can and cannot provide to students in the district. And finally, I think, you know, the running theme that I've heard throughout from every single parent is this culture of lack of acceptance, that it's not just about providing the education, providing the, the, the same quote unquote education as general education students are, it's providing an experience, providing the the, the environment where the students feel welcome, they feel like they belong, and that they feel like they're part of the school culture and can participate in every single part of it. And that is extremely critical if we want to start to turn this around. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Thank you so much. We are gonna to go to question five now. Significant disproportionality exists when a district has over-identified or under-identified students in certain racial or ethnic groups as needing special education. The state has flagged AUSD as identifying Black or African American males for special education at a higher rate than that of their peers of other races for three years in a row. What do you think is at the root of AUSD's disproportionality challenge and how would you address it as a board member? And John Castleberry, you go first on this one. Okay, um, thank you for this question. Um, <clears throat> unconscious bias and implicit bias. Um, this, is, this, this situation is, is a, a, a a, a, a perfect example of exactly why representation and, and cultural perspective matters. And it's also why I applied to be on the participation um, CEIS uh, stakeholder team. You know, black boys are viewed differently um, than their white peers for the same behavior. Also, they don't receive the same level of service or compassion. When a black child acts out, the reasons are not investigated. Is he hungry? Is he tired? Um, he's simply deemed a problem. Um, and when a black child struggles academically, it is assumed they can't learn, rather than that there may be external issues happening for that child. Racism is real in the public school system. When a child is sitting in a room and can feel that the adult doesn't care about them, then that's all they can think about. They are not interested in the content of discussion. They want to know why they don't belong. So, so they disengage and, and th th they become misdiagnosed with attention deficit. We need to, um, and, and this is going to be a very difficult thing to do, be, and, and we know that just because it's a microcosm of the world. Um, changing the hearts and minds of people and how 
uh, black and brown boys are viewed and, and just the way that their normal childhood behavior is interpreted. Um, and it is uh, criminalized. It is, it is what is at the center of the um, school to prison pipeline. It is, the, it is, the, same, it is the same mentality. Um, you know, there, there aren't degrees of racism. You know, it's a, it all comes out of the same toxic pool. Um, is what causes um, black and brown bodies to be treated differently than non-black and brown bodies. And, and so, and obviously it goes into every fabric of, uh, into every fiber of the fabric of our society. And, and unfortunately education and special ed Thank is you. not immune to that. Thank, Thank you. you so much, John. Beth, Amy. Thank you. And thank you for this question. It's it's so important, um, especially now. And I want to thank Mr. Castleberry, too, for his perspective and comments. Um, I think it's really important that we're hearing from uh, the African-American community on this issue. Um, and I've said before um, in other forums um, that, that this issue um, of uh, our Black and brown children being disproportionately affected is critical. And it, to, to make a really positive change, it's gonna require some very hard conversations with our community. We have to deal with our equity issues. We have to deal with our systemic racism issues. We have to provide some additional resources and training for our teachers and our staff to ensure that they are self-aware and, and to make sure that we are not um, marginalizing our students of color. Um, especially those who are, you know, unfortunately then classified as having uh, learning um, issues. So having these, um, the, the, the CEIS and the special ed plan is really important. Having people who are knowledgeable and aware of what's going on in our community, having those people on those task forces is critically important. And having um, a board who is going to really listen and respond to those issues and hold the district accountable for making sure that we are just not putting children into those classifications because of our, uh, you know, certain, certain perspectives. So I applaud the district in doing the work. Um, there's lots of work to be done. There's lots of work to be done by all of us um, throughout the community, whether you are a teacher, a staff member, a school administrator, or a parent. We all have to come together, discuss the issues, and figure out a way that we're going to ensure that students aren't um, disproportionately affected. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beth. Jennifer Williams. Uh, thank you. Um, this question is really important to me. It affects my family uh, deeply. Um, so I, on the, out, at the outset, I think it's important to note that there's 21 different categories for state oversight in this work. Eight years ago, AUSD, or, or, I'm sorry, three years ago, AUSD um, had eight areas of improvement. Uh, this year, we have two areas of improvement. I think we are moving in the right direction in this district because of the implementation of restorative practices. We've seen over the past three years that when we change the way uh, we handle discipline, for example, in the classroom, specifically with our African-American students, our outcomes for them improve. Um, so we are moving in the right direction, um, but why do I think what's the root cause of this, I think is bias. We have um, a white standard of what constitutes a good student in our classrooms. And we need to tackle that and handle it. The two areas uh, where we need to improve is for our African-American kids who uh, have generally been diagnosed with ADHD um, and then intellectual disability. So we have an overrepresentation of these students um, being referred. We've had significant professional development on these issues, training around trauma-informed instruction, implicit bias, race, culture. Um, as folks have said, the district has created a comprehensive coordinated early intervention services team. I'm on the leadership team for the district. The, the district knows how important this work is to me. We're doing outreach right now for our stakeholder group. We've partnered with Kingmakers of Oakland to do a systemic audit um, to see where we can improve our policies and procedures and curriculum around race. Um, but, you know, cultural responsibility really needs to be at the core of every decision we make so that every child feels worthy. 
I've seen what happens um, to my own children when they're in classrooms where they read books uh, by authors that look like them. They have art on the walls that is representative of their culture. My daughter's comprehension level skipped a grade um, when she was surrounded by this work. It's very important to me. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Megan Sweet. Yeah, this proportion, uh, when I reviewed the data around special education services for students um, in Alameda, especially African American students, um, it's backed around um, services related to emotional disturbance, um, identifying them as intellectually dis disabled or health impaired. And again, these are all patterns that track with overall disproportionality and placement of African American students in special education across the country. And as everyone has said, is indicative of systemized racism in our country and the influence of, of implicit bias. Um, and it is absolutely a part of the prison, school to prison pipeline um, that also includes disproportionate disciplinary measures, um, and overall academic achievement of students of color. So we need to prioritize this training moving forward. The district absolutely has put some fundamental pieces in place that Jennifer named, and it's gonna require consistent ongoing collaboration, communication, and work. Um, addressing racism and implicit bias is a daily issue for all of us. It's not something that we enter into once, have one PD and we move on. It's, it's an ongoing conversation and self-analysis so that we know how to work differently. Um, for AUSD, I think that we need to um, deepen our work on cultural responsive pedagogy. So the staff had a training on that last year, but to really understand that the impact on students when, when you're a student who has your culture not represented in your classroom, or you experience actually an affront to your culture in your classroom, it actually shuts down the kids' capacity to learn. They go into fight, flight, or freeze most. So we really need to address that. We need to have a more for a deeper audit of families and conversations with our BIPOC families to understand what's happening with them especially those with IEPs. And um, we need to take a hard look at our practices and, and understand what we need to do differently. Um, that does start with a, opening up the conversation. We need to learn to be able to talk with each other across difference and understand how to work together differently. And we need to boost the supports for these multi-tiered systems of support that Jennifer described so well, of proactive measures, of ways of creating inclusion and safety for all students. Uh, both social emotionally and academically so that um, we don't need to refer students to special education. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan. Heather Ladle. Thanks. Um, like Jen mentioned, I think there were two places that uh, we were dinged by the state, the over-identification of African-American boys in particular in a special education and also uh, for the area of discipline. So I want to also talk about both. Um, I completely agree with what everyone else has said. We have a real problem in this country with um, uh, aspects of implicit bias, um, the, in, the lack of awareness around how to address trauma-informed care, and um, making sure that we are being very thoughtful and self introspective about what we are bringing into the conversation when it comes to over-identifying uh, our uh, African-American boys into special education. But I also want to caution us because looking at the data, I want to make sure that if there is an actual need, an actual true identified need, and that these students are then actually getting the services to be successful in school, I don't want to discount that because that's the very definition of equity and targeted universalism. Um, and something that I really want to caution us about, I think the language that the district is uh, using, I want to read it, I wrote it down. This year, AUSD will defer 15% of the federal special education funds it receives to general education budget implement to implement activities designed to prevent a student from being referred to an assessment for disability. I completely disagree with that. I do not think that that is the business that we want to be in. We want to really harness the importance of early identification and intervention. And I'm so glad to hear uh, Beth particularly mention that, that we cannot just stop the process. And I want to make sure that I recognize it's important to be careful, but that language really scares me. Um, I also think it's really critical that we talk about the concept of discipline. Our African American students in special education are absolutely being disproportionately suspended or given harsher disciplines than their peers, and we have to look into what kind of ex uh, escalation or disciplinary practices are leading to that particular practice. Um, I think taking the step of removing uh, school resource officers is definitely a step in the right direction, but we need to do more. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Verna Castro. Um, thank you for all of that. I think you, you know, together we'll have the answers. Um, 
you all mentioned implicit bias. I mean, I'm gonna start with that. That's really important to, to have those conversations throughout our community and ongoing. Um, I wanna just uh, uh, let you know that um, 34 years I've worked in, in, in the area of the city in San Francisco, which is the black and brown community. And I chose that intentionally because that's how I grew up. And, and the, the success I've had with the black and brown com uh, community is something that I would bring to Alameda, okay? So I kind of know how strategically, you know, how to build relationships with parents and, and, and how to talk you know, about, you know, anti-racist education. I've been involved in anti-racist education planning in the district as well. Um, so the other thing I want to just make note of is culturally responsive pedagogy that Megan um, Sweet uh, alluded to. Uh, just on Tuesday, I attended a panel meeting with um, Superintendent Tony Thurman, State su Superintendent, regarding the K-12 ethnic studies curriculum. I'm on the development part of the Pacific Islander and Arabic um, education learning. Um, so African American studies, uh, Asian American studies, Latin American studies, Asian American studies will be a part of the ethnic studies curriculum K to 12. And, you know, within our community at AUSD, you know, we'll also address other uh, lessons within that. So I think that's really important to bring that curriculum to our student. Um, uh, the other thing I want to mention is that one of my plans is a wellness plan. Okay, when we're, we're talking about all of these pieces, I think it's also important to, to understand that our African American boys need wellness. We all need wellness. Okay, so to support through uh, my plan is to have wellness centers in all the schools, school based, school based wellness centers. Okay, and to, to, to uh, promote uh, safety and inclusive schools. And uh, I think that would be a, a, um, you know, a good step in kind of a uh, part of the solutions. Thank you, Verna. All righty, thank you guys so much. We're gonna move on to question six, our last question before um, closing statements. Over the last decade, educational researchers have made significant advances in understanding the interventions that are most effective in addressing the diverse learning needs of students with disabilities. According to parents, AUSD does not seem to have a good system for identifying best practices and implementing them at scale across the district. What can the board do to ensure that the district implements best practices for supporting students with disabilities consistently and coherently? Uh, we're going to start with Beth. Thank you. Thank you for this question. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I think um, making sure that the district is held accountable at every level um, is critically important to make sure that we are implementing best practices. And uh, like I said before, where the law says must and shall, the district should, should do those things. And the board um, can hold the district's feet to the fire and make sure that they are engaging the community and providing the services that our special education families are legally entitled to. Um, like I said before, I named that at the board meeting on Tuesday and the district did make a change uh, and supported by uh, Jennifer Williams who asked some hard questions as well, um, that the families are going to be engaged in the LCP process. So we are doing that now and I'm happy that the district has is doing what they're supposed to be doing. Another thing that the board can do too, I think, um, is um, provide um, in, in conjunction with the superintendent's review process, um, have some special indicators or data points that must be um, addressed or achieved um, in the work with special education. So I think that can be part of the process. Um, I think there can be some more creative ways that the board can get involved with special education, uh, certainly oversight of the budget, how, um, how are special education specifically benefiting with details um, and not just glossing over any numbers, but details. And I think special education families deserve to know that information. And the board can then certainly look at how that money is being spent um, to best serve our most vulnerable students. Thank you. Thank you, John Castleberry. So I, I feel that um, more stringent reporting requirements for site administrators, 
um, to report to the district and for the district to re be reporting to the board and to identify real time challenges and get uh, faculty the support they need to fulfill their commitment to the students and their stewardship. Um, you know, bias tracking, for example, in the district is really limited. It really only reports on uh, uh, large scale demonstrations of bias, like, um, uh, you know, uh, some um, a, a graffiti that's um, um, offensive graffiti or a noose or something that's really overt. But it doesn't, it's not tracking the nuanced things that are really impacting a student in real time in their classroom every single day. And things like, you know, uh, microaggressions and, you know, as as a parent, you you can tell when your your child doesn't feel right in a, in an environment, and sometimes getting the child to articulate that is the challenge. Not identifying that that they're not okay, you can identify that, but getting them to articulate it is often more the challenge. And then, because microaggressions are extremely hard to prove, um, also a lot of things that happen as a result are biased are very hard to prove. You don't have a picture that you can show somebody. You have to describe it and you have to give backstory and you have to show patterns. And, and, and when these complaints and concerns come in, they need to be recorded, they need to be reported, they need to be included so that uh, patterns can be identified. If we can't identify the patterns, we can't address the patterns. We can't fix something that we're not looking at and that we're not identifying. And so we have got to be um, more, we have to look at um, some of these concerns on a more granular level and, and be able to identify what's really happening for children in real time. Um, I see I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you, John. I realize I went out of order on my list here, so I'm going to get back to the right order. Apologies for that. I was looking ahead to the next question. Jennifer Williams, you are next. Should have been next. And you're next now. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think this question goes to the heart of our strategic plan. Um, there's a goal in our strategic plan around the service delivery model that talks about this exact issue. Um, we need to make sure that the district is providing a continuum of services that develop the whole child using research-based approaches. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I think that now that we're going to have collaboration be part of the master schedule, there will be training on this exact issue. And we, we will see um, training around best practices being implemented during this collaboration time. So I think that's really important. But as Beth said, the role of the board is to really hold the district's feet to the fire and ensure that the goals of our strategic plan are being met. Um, the strategic plan steering committee needs to get up and running again. They met twice before COVID and I understand COVID has made everybody pivot and change, but that group really needs to start working again and provide the oversight to the strategic plan. They will then report back to the board and the board can um, take that in information into account and where the district falls short. Um, the board needs to hold the district accountable. You know, as Beth said, I did that the other night at the, um, at the board meeting when we were talking about the local continuity plan and specifically with regard to how the district is serving students with unique needs and I voted against it and they went back to the table and they have to do some more work. So that's the kind of, uh, of oversight that the board can provide. And we also need to do our own homework and our own research. You know, a big part of my work in special ed is work that I do in my professional life um, involved with child abuse and neglect cases, but also looking at how other self has served families. I mentioned the Placer County SELFA before. They have a much more child-centered approach to how service delivery looks, and board members need to do their own research and find um, other ways when what the district is sharing with us doesn't, doesn't meet up to the standards that we want for all of our kids. Thank you. Uh, Megan Sweet. Yeah, I, I, I love this question because I'm a systems person. So I love when a question says um, there's something missing across the system in Alameda. And I do think that's actually one of the core issues in Alameda is that really, and it happens in, in school districts across the country, and it certainly happened in the one where I was a district leader individual experiences at schools have a little bit too much bearing on what a student's outcomes will be rather than what the, what the district overall can provide. And Alameda is small enough and there are enough resources and people here where no students should be falling through the cracks and no students should be getting um, 
an education that's not meeting their, their specific needs. So I'm gonna advocate again for a district-wide approach. Specifically around special education, um, I think early intervention is really important. And actually that starts in preschool. So one of the other areas that were identified um, as a need um, in the findings for Alameda Unified was more comprehensive support starting at the preschool level. Because if we can get students um, addressed, their learning needs addressed or their um, specific um, ident identified areas of need in their IEP addressed starting in preschool, we actually can prevent a lot of these future and kind of down the line issues because we actually can start them earlier on. So I think we need to do that. Um, we need to also work on inclusion, which is something that hasn't come up today, but is a really powerful strategy that actually improves school communities um, and, and the outcomes for experiences for general education students as well as those with IEPs. So there's ways that we can include students more proactively in our schools, especially students with IEPs, um, so that they feel like they're a part of the general school community and are not kind of cordoned off to one specific part of the school or one um, unique experience. And finally, I'm so excited to hear that we have staff. Um, that's a really huge accomplishment for the district to have uh, appropriate special education staff. And now we actually need to dedicate our time and energy to training those staff on how to work with students and how to develop a, a complex array of ways of addressing student needs as they move in and out of being sheltered in place and back at school again. Um, I think that's well worth the time and effort um, to support our special education students. Thanks. Thank you. Heather Little. Thanks so much. Um, it's the job of the board members to raise questions exactly like this with the superintendent and the administrative staff and encourage the exploration and research and sharing of best practices, especially knowing that a quarter of our special education students are not graduating despite what, you know, the changes that we've been making. And I'm really encouraged to hear so many people on the panel today talking about the importance of early identification intervention, because that is actually a best practice that I'd like to see our district put forward. But I also want to note that we're in a day and age where uh, getting access to information about best practices, you know, I got on my computer like three weeks ago and to look up best practices. And I talked with parents, I, I got on the phone, and I talked with Jody Daniel, what do you think are the best practices? And she immediately pointed me to University of Santa Barbara's uh, Kogel's Autism Center. And they are more than willing to share everything and anything that they are doing about their innovative ways to use strength-based interventions and make amazing experiences for their students and their families. And that being said, I think we have a lot of bright spots across the entire district and we could develop an internal training and information sharing um, proponent and encourage our special education teachers to not only research and share their own best practices that they've been implementing, but to also pull in general education students into that training and learning as well. Because as we've talked about previously, this is an entire culture and that we want all of our students to feel included. And that means making sure that our general education and special education teachers and staff have the understanding of how to best interact with and educate special education students. Um, I've been working with First Five, and one of the things that we um, really identified was really important is the concept of learning collaboratives. It is completely free, and we have recognized the power of peer-to-peer -peer interventions or peer-to-peer -peer sharing of interventions and best practices and lifting up learnings and experiences. And I think if we could solidify that across the district so that our teachers do not feel as isolated within their one singular school that they're working in, it would really be a benefit to all. Thank you. Thank you Heather. Uh, Verna Castro. Thank you again. Um, talk about two things. One is um, uh, one part of the strategic plan and secondly is thinking outside the box, okay? So the first is uh, with the strategic plan goal of student intervention and identification, all agreed with identifying students early because the earlier you identify, you know, it's possible that, you know, they will have the, the pro appropriate services. Um, I think that um, within that, um, one is to fully develop and implement a multi-tiered academic and behavioral system of support, which is important, and two, um, infuse the supports and embedded services through general education, tier one, two, three programs, and three is implement consistent professional learning for teachers and administrators related to early intervention and identification of needed supports. Um, all of these are best practices and research based on the plan and to scale. So it kind of answering that part of the question. The second part that I, I want to bring to it is, you know, I've always 
have been an innovator and I've always thought outside the box. So um, some of the things I've done um, is really push up. I mean, our special ideas, they're special, they have needs, you give them resources. However, what's missing is the rigor. And I think, um, you know, uh, uh, and examples, I had a student who was in special ed and, and she thought it, the, the, the curriculum was dumbed down. So we gave her regular curriculum from the classroom and she was able to attain to that. Um, I was at a school, I was athletic director and um, have a lot of African American students in athletics. You know the power of athletics. It's a, it's, it's a venue for students to perform. So I said Let, you had to have a 3.0 to uh, participate. And with structures, they were able to get that. 90% of my students, my black and brown students, hit 3.0. So it's, it's, it's a matter, you know, you can go research-based, but you also have to go, you know, what's authentic to the student, okay? Um, so um, going back to the regular curriculum, bringing that into class so, so that it's robust enough for the students and they're motiva motivated enough to learn that. So um, thank you on that. Thanks, Clara. Thank you so much. We have come to the end of the questions for the candidates. We will now take two minutes closing statements from each candidate. And since we started in the reverse ballot order, we are actually being able to end in the ballot order. So we are going to start with Beth Any. Two minutes closing statement. Thank you. And thank you to our ACEBED families for uh, coordinating this wonderful forum here today. I think it's been a great opportunity for all of us um, to talk about these very critical and important issues. And uh, thank you for putting it together, especially Heather Padgett. Appreciate your time. Um, as a parent of two AUSD students and in conjunction with my extensive PTA work and work on the Yes on Measure A campaign, I've had the opportunity to work with parents, teachers, and AUSD staff and understand the challenges and issues in this district. Um, our special education challenges are even greater. And in talking with many, many families, their stories are just simply heartbreaking. And doing the work necessary to make sure that we mend those hearts and that we bring people back together is critically important to me. A key goal of mine is to bring stakeholders closer together so that we can work collaboratively to improve educational opportunities and experiences for all students, especially our special education students. By listening and working together, we can raise the achievement level of all students. I truly believe that. Equity is another important issue and I will work hard to understand the unique barriers um, and challenges that our students have, our special education students, talking with families so that every student has the tools and resources they need to be successful. Um, we need to have supports. We need to have credentialed and trained teachers. We need to make sure that those resources are in, pl resources are in place. I'm a litigation attorney by profession and know how to gather information and collaborate with stakeholders. And I'm not afraid of having hard conversations that will result in the best outcomes for our students. I've done the work here in Alameda and have strong leadership skills, and I'm ready to step into the role of school board member on day one. Thank you for your time today. Ellie. Thank you. Um, so that was bad. John Castleberry. Hi, first I just I want to really thank you for hosting this forum and, and inviting me to participate. I'm, I'm running a grassroots campaign seeking the opportunity to work for all the children and families of the AUSD community and to that end the dedicated teachers and staff. My platform is one of equity, access for the underserved and special needs community, uh, uh, community and unity through collaboration. The special needs families are, are among the most vulnerable of our community. As a parent, I, I have a deep understanding of the level of faith it takes to entrust our children into the care of others. All the parents of special needs students I speak to have a, a similar um, through line of concerns. Their concerns most commonly center around, but not limited to, navigating the process of getting the services their families deserve, meaningful benefit, and assessment practices. I would like to see an improved mechanism by which parents' input, feedback, and concerns are acknowledged, examined, and, add, and addressed by the district with oversight by the board in a timely fashion to help mitigate learning loss for students. The obvious benefit of this would be to the students, but also empower teachers and paraprofessionals with evidentiary data to acquire district support 
in their efforts to provide for these students. Of course, every, con every conversation referencing services ultimately has fiscal implications. Another sentiment underlying for parents in all underserved communities is somehow feeling like they are alone or at the very least not recognized with the urgency their voices warrant. However, if parents could feel assured that their input would affect forward motion, many would divert some of the energies they feel are spent just trying to be heard toward an effective subcommittee that is recognized and has a real seat at the table. Thank you for allowing me to participate today. Thank you, John. Verna Castro. Thank you, parents, once again. In closing, I return to the personal experience of having my email broken into. Speech here deleted before my eyes because this was not without value. Not without value as it's yet another reminder our children with neurodiversity have not yet realized an equitable playing field when it comes to education. They've been historically marginalized and I can empathize having my own experience in neurodiversity with my close family members. For children I've taught and coached and led, coping with limited resources is an extra burden, just learning in a stimulating environment with accommodations. They deserve sensitivity and opportunities to excel. I am a candidate that does not presume to know it all. I hold history in the school district or even come with all the answers, but it's because of personal identity and professional experience as an educator of 34 years with neurodiverse children in PE and athletics that I'm sensitive to these children that have been marginalized. I'm a leader that listens carefully before acting. I know everyone has a unique story and interest and in this time of so much turbulence and person with experience collaborating and advocating for those marginalized especially is needed. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Verna. Heather Little. Uh, thank you all also so much and to Heather and I believe Shay um, for uh, bringing this group together. It's to me by far the most profound conversation I think we've had the opportunity to participate in. Um, I have uh, for years actually had conversations with special education families, but it hasn't really been until recently that I have sat down with large groups of them and heard the heartbreaking stories about um, about the experiences they've been having and to really feel and be presented with the pain and frustration of years of disappointment when it is so clear to me that just like every single parent out there you just want an educational experience and an environment where your child is honored and your child is appreciated for their uniqueness and and their appreciation for what they could bring to this school district environment mm -hmm. um and and i want i want to be a part of that process and make that move forward. Um, from what I can see, and I think what has been named repeatedly, uh, is that the most urgent needs are in making sure that now that we've got a full workload for our special education uh, uh, department, that we maintain them, that we're able to keep them happy and on board and getting the rich educational training that they need to continue and feel successful as well, as well as improving communication and the dialogue with staffing and parents and students as well is also critically important. Um, I want to make sure that we're keeping track of the goals and that we go back and revisit the strategic plan and that we, when, when it is revisited at the end of the school year and readdress that we build in those aspects of equity throughout so that we've got really good clear benchmarks and can have a better understanding of how we can meet everybody's needs. But most of all, I, we have to absolutely maintain the importance of listening to our teachers and our staff who work with our kids, listen to the families and students and, and, and get a good grounding in their experiences as well because they are the experts on the topic. They know best about what has been happening with them and they know best about how to improve it. So thank you. Thank you, Heather. Megan Sweet. Yeah, first I just want to thank um, the ASPED parents and, and all of the panelists for the opportunity to be speaking and listening today. Um, it's a rare gift to be able to have a platform to share your ideas so publicly and as someone who has a passion for education, I, I take these opportunities really seriously and I have a lot of gratitude for this moment. Today in particular, I want to send my thoughts out to Brianna Taylor's family and to all who have been acted in, uh, impacted by the outcome of that trial. Um, we're in really challenging times and I think the more we can be unified, it's important for us to do so. 
Uh, I strongly believe that community lies at the heart of a school and that schools have a great influence on whether each individual in that school, be they guardians, parents, staff, or students feel included in that community. Uh, Alameda has some excellent schools and currently does a great job of creating community for some people. I'm running for school board to advance a sense of community to include all of us, including uh, those who identify as LGBTQ+, as um, BIPOC, as single parents, low income, or a family of students who, who receive special education services, folks that don't often feel as included as a part of Alameda Unified School District. Creating a sense of community and belonging is a basic human right in our schools, and with that, we're not serving our students appropriately. As a parent, I've been working to advance equity and inclusion at my son's school. If elected, I'd be an active and focused ally in creating more equitable inclusive schools across all of Alameda. As a lifelong educator with direct experience as a teacher, school administrator, and district administrator, my knowledge and skills are needed for Alameda right now as we make um, the informed decisions and have to take decisive action to address student needs in an ever-changing um, background. As an aunt um, of, a, of a nephew who um, had special educate who had special needs and as a former special education teacher myself, the needs of our um, students with IEPs is a particular area of passion. I'm running on a platform of creating strong school communities, supporting our district's fiscal, fiscal vitality and addressing the inequities in our system. And I vow to be an ally in this work. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Jennifer Williams. Thank you. Um, I want to first thank the Alameda Special Ed Family Support Group for hosting this event today and for all of the panelists who participated this morning. Um, it's been the honor of my life to serve the Alameda community on the Board of Education. I've worked hard to represent the interests of students and staff alike uh, during these past four years, and it would be an honor for me to serve again if re-elected to the board. We're at a critical period of time in public education with complex challenges facing us. And in my opinion, we need board members who know where we've come from in this work and who can continue to provide stability and strong leadership moving forward, especially during this pandemic. We must focus on our families uh, receiving special education services so that they receive the education they're legally entitled to. And we must move from the statement that everyone belongs here into action. A systemic review of our policies, programs, and curriculum so that our African American students and our students with disabilities continue to thrive. Despite this pandemic, I'm actually really hopeful about the path that this district is on. We are finally calling out learning gaps for our African American students and for our students with disabilities. We are also engaged in an audit across all systems so that we can finally start to take the deep dive necessary to make improvements. Moving forward, we are going to need a board that supports this work. The teachers union has endorsed Beth, Heather, and myself. I know that the three of us share common goals around special education and other issues facing the school district. I hope that I've earned your support today and thank you again for allowing me to participate. Thank you for those closing statements. I'm going to wrap it up here. That was um, just a, an amazing and deep conversation, the likes of which I've never heard before. So I really, really appreciated um, having you guys here. There was so much more we could have discussed and so many more follow ups that I wanted to ask. Um, but you guys give us a ton to think about. Thank you. Um, so uh, as I said, thanks for joining us. We truly commend you for being willing to throw your hat into the ring and to serve your community candidates. Um, our country and the world is going through a rough time right now, exposing issues that may have been simmering below the surface in the past, and we need leadership to help us navigate it. So thank you. Also wanna thank our families and educators and community members watching today for taking the time to share your real life questions and concerns with us. Even though we can't actually see everyone out there right now, rest assured that uh, ACEBED sees you. I also want to thank our ACEBED advisory board, uh, who jumped in with both feet when I reached out to say, I think I want to do this thing. Uh, in addition to Ellie Archer and Danielle Poole, who you met tonight, uh, today and who did a fantastic job, Danielle, thank you so much for your timing. I could never have kept up with that. Thank you. Uh, our advisory board also includes Christine Strena, Shay Phillips, who was working the chat today, Elizabeth Tran Wong, and Suzette 
Johns. They have just been amazing to work with and they didn't abandon me once despite lots of evening Zoom planning calls while all juggling their own personal and professional lives. So thank you. For parents, I want to encourage you to stay tuned. We are still negotiating on a date, but it is our plan to hold our traditional back to school night with district special ed staff, hopefully in October. Um, and we invite uh, anyone in the community to attend that. Um, and that will be obviously on Zoom. We are also figuring out our plans to offer events and informal support conversations via Zoom uh, and not in this webinar format, in a more conversational format. Um, so stay tuned. We hope that even more families are able to participate this year since we'll be in a casual virtual environment. Lastly, I wanna make sure to let each of you candidates know that ASED is and can be an ongoing resource for you if you are elected and even if you are not. We would be more than happy to answer questions for you as things come up on the board or reach out to our members if you need independent confirmation regarding how things are really going out in the field. We will be here. Okay, people, mail-in ballots come out next week and you know we need to get those in early this year, so please don't wait. Vote, vote, vote. Thank you again for joining us. I will be sharing a recording of this event uh, as well as contact information for all the candidates. Thank you all and have a great day.